Tissue by MTS Darker, I know it is probably no one's favourite poem, apart from mine. Actually, there's a lot of good poems in the Power and Conflict anthology, but I gotta say, when I first read Tissue, I really loved it. Um, I can understand why people don't like it, but I promise you, by the end of this video, you're gonna have a much better handle on this poem, and it might even be one of your favourite poems too. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna read Tissue together, I know, I know you've read it a million times before, probably, you don't want to read it again, but we're gonna read it again, I'm gonna read it to you, you're gonna read along, and then we're gonna analyze it. We're gonna break it down and we're gonna discuss it and we're gonna get a real handle on it. If you really can't stand reading it again, you're like, come on Ben, I already know this fucking poem, then I've got timestamps in the description below so you can jump about to whatever part of the video suits you right now. And once we have read it, once we've read Tissue, this is what your paper's gonna look like. Tissue by Imitaz Darker. Paper that lets the light shine through. This is what could alter things. Paper thinned by age or touching. The kind you find in well-used books. The back of the Quran, where a hand has written in the names and histories. Who was born to whom, the height and weight. Who died where and how, on which sepia date. Pages smoothed and stroked, and turned transparent with attention. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift. See how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the direction of the wind. Maps, too. The sun shines through their borderlines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, Find slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card might fly our lives like paper kites. An architect could use all this, place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block. But let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths, through the shapes that pride can make. Find a way to trace a grand design with living tissue. Raise a structure never meant to last, of paper smoothed and stroked and thin to be transparent, turned into your skin. Oh boy! Yeah, I can see why you don't like the poem, or at least why you think it's a difficult poem. And that's because, well, some of the other poems that you, ha you uh, read have a very rigid form, don't they? So not only are they rigid in the, in the fact that they have the same, like, meter, like da dum da dum da dum but they also have the same rhyme scheme. Everything's quite predictable. Everything else kind of looks like a poem. And the, another reason why you probably don't like this is because this is very free verse. There is rhyme, but it's not end-stopped rhyme. There's internal rhymes. The funny thing is, though, it looks free verse because there is enjambment. Enjambment, enjambment, that is where the, the line keeps running. So for example, most poems, you know, typically, you know, stereotypically, the poem will end each line with a comma or a, you know, exclamation point, a full stop, whatever. Enjambment just means it keeps running through. And she does this, uh, the poet, she writes using a lot of enjambment, which we'll, we'll talk about what that means, why she does that in a bit. But let's start from the beginning, okay? Right, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go line by line and just we'll throw stuff out as it comes up. Paper that lets the light shine through. Now, obviously, the poem is about paper. Now, the title is called Tissue, which is a very specific type of paper, isn't it? The tissue is very delicate, probably more delicate than paper. But all we know is because this is the first word in the poem that is important. Always look at the ends and the beginnings of poems. So what's the first word? What's the last word? And if we zoom down to the end, all right, what's the last word? Skin. Isn't that amazing? Think about that, okay? So we begin, she's talking about paper. And all through this poem, she's talking about how um, precious human life is. And she's seeing how paper, like what you write your histories on, like, you know, what's in the Bible and stuff like that, stuff where we print our, our family identity through the ages, we print it on paper, all right? This is what comprises our identity. And there's a transformation going on through the poem. We'll get to this in a bit, but you can even see she uses words of transformation like alter. Or in the third stanza, okay, she says, 
turned transparent with attention. So this idea of turning, becoming something else, change, okay? And even we can see when she says later, near the end, an architect could use all this. And so what does an architect do? Well, he builds stuff, he changes raw materials into a more definite form, into a grander form, okay? Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but just know that it's very significant that the very first word, paper, and the very last word, skin. She wants us to see the relationship between paper and skin. She wants us to see the connection between these two things. All right, it's about paper, it's about skin. And we know paper is also important because she repeats it in the fourth line of the first stanza. Again, she begins with paper thinned by age or touching. So this might be super crazy, but for me, if you look at that first stanza, look how it is laid out. So you've got paper beginning and paper on the fourth, okay? And then you've got bits in the middle. So to me, I mean, this might be completely crazy, but this looks like she's creating a book almost with the two words. You've got paper, paper, all right? And in between the paper, in between the covers, you've got the content. And what is the content? Well, content that can show you the light, show you the way. Do you know the way? Content that is transformative. So let's read it. Paper that lets the light shine through. This is what could alter things. Hmm. Okay, look at the end of the line, of the first line. Light. That is religious lexis. That is, which is also reinforced in the second stanza when she talks about the Quran, refers to the Quran. Now let's, I don't have a Quran with me, although I have read it. I do, however, have a Bible. All right, and now if you've ever read a Bible, you know exactly what the paper is like. Look how thin that paper is, okay? Now if you held a light up to that, you could see through it. In fact, it's so thin that you can see the words on the other side. It lets the light shine through. So because light is a religious word, it is religious because light just doesn't just mean light from the sun. Light means guidance. It means bringing you out of darkness. It means showing you the way. It means showing you how to live your life or giving you the solution to a problem and stuff like that, okay? It's like God said, let there be light. The Bible is full of imagery to do with light. So it's very important. So when you read this, there's this idea, the light shining through is a metaphor. It doesn't just shine through the pages, it shines through the words. So the, the words say something to you and you can go beyond the words. They're like a gateway into something else. They're, they're a guidance, all right? And the whole thing is, people do use the Bible, people do use the Quran for guidance, spiritual guidance, to know the way. And later in the poem, the poet is gonna talk about maps, all right? So she really wants to show you how paper and skin are linked to this idea of guidance, okay? And finding a way and stuff like that. We'll get into that in a sec, all right? You've got the religious and visual language, like with light, okay? And shining, shining through. And then you've got the religious lexis, the religious language is reinforced with the Quran, okay? And now this is a very, very strong image. Now, if you look at, where is it? Line four, six, the back of the Quran, where a hand, there's only really three words that she, the poet, wants us to concentrate on. Because the rest are just like articles or prepositions or whatever. She wants us to focus on back, Quran, hand. Okay, so they're linked. Not only that, but she uses a cacophony sound effect. K -k 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 back, Quran. She really wants us to focus. All right, and why the back? Because you've got back of the Quran and hand. She wants us to see someone touching this religious holy book, connecting with it. This idea that paper can become skin. It's to transform, you have to read it, you have to let the light shine through, you have to be absorbed with it, okay? But then it's gonna go deeper, the messages. They're not just words on a page, they get into you. They go travel through your hand, up into your body, into your soul, all that stuff. And why the back? Because it implies, I think it implies, that the reader has, you know, read through quite thoroughly and they finished it. Here's another thing that implies that it's well read. She actually says it, well-used books. There's a sing-song quality to this line because there's internal rhyming, the kind you find. This is iambic tetrameter. Iambic da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. And tetrameter's four feet. But the last three syllables have almost equal weight and emphasis, I think. 
well-used books. And this has the effect of slowing that down. So you're singing along the kind you find in well-used books. Boom, boom, boom. She really wants to draw attention to the fact that it's a well-used book. And that the person has been through this quite a lot. You have to slow down to say it. This is why you've got to read poetry out loud. Anytime you have to slow down to say something, it means the poet wants you to notice that bit. All right, they want you to pay attention. And speaking of attention, this is why it's all important to pay attention. She actually uses the word attention. Where a hand is written in the names and histories, who was born to whom, the height and weight, who died where and how, on which sepia date, pages smoothed and stroked and turned, transparent with attention. All right, so they're transparent with attention. Yes, the book is see-through. It's transparent, you can see through it. It's not completely though, it's just a little bit, but she's saying that this thin paper, the more you focus on it, the more attention you, you give it, the more you see through it. So you see the message, you see what this holy book is trying to say. Not only that, you see back into your history. She really wants you to see history and, and get these ideas of family and identity. You're adding your family history to your culture, to your religion, to your background, okay? You are part of it. It's connected because not only in the written word, you've written your family and your history in there, but you're touching it and you're touching it a lot and you're touching it with a lot of care. Now listen to this, pages smoothed and stroked and turned. Repetition is important. It shows significance and, and. So these are very delicate verbs. They're quite loving. It's like someone who adores what they're doing. And there's three of them. The rule of three is very powerful with the human mind. So she uses the rule of three with these delicate verbs and wants to show turning, stroking, all right? So this is, this is someone who values what's within this book, but not because of the book itself, but because of what the book can show you. It's a piece of guidance. It, it shows you the light. Do you know the word sepia, by the way? I, I wonder if people just know this because of like Instagram filters and shit, but like, yeah, the sepia date, which is really nice because the poet takes an abstract idea, an abstract noun like date, and infuses it with color. So sepia, date. Sure, okay, maybe the date's written in and you can actually see it on the page, but the idea is this, this date, this abstract thing, which isn't like, can you see a date? If it wasn't on a calendar or written down, you can't see a date. It's abstract. It's not like a cup of coffee. A date is um, something you can't see. But suddenly, with the wisdom of this book, it's like you can almost see it. You can see the color of time. It's sepia. Um, you know what sepia looks like? It's all like browned and stuff with age, okay? And also being like well turned and stuff. Now there's a lot of enjambment in this poem, which, you know, caesura is like the pause. So for example, paper that lets the light shine through. Pause, that's a caesura. But light shine through, that's enjambment, because she's running on to the next line, is what could alter things? Pause. Paper thinned by age or touching, the kind you find in well-used books. So when does she pause? If you pay attention, you'll see that it's any time she gives this idea of transformation. So there's a, the first pause in the poem comes after alter things. She, so why is the pause there? She puts the pause there because it's a significant place to pause for thought. So the reason you're pausing for thought there is because she wants you to think about alteration and transformation. And again, turned transparent with attention. So she doesn't stop the line at, you know, turning. She wants it to go on with enjambment because it's almost like you're in the process of evolution, of transformation. And then once you've turned transparent with attention, pause. So what, how do you give something your attention? You have to let some space come between you and what you're trying to focus on. You can't just keep going, going, and going, and going. So after attention, full stop, pause. We're gonna reflect, okay? And there's this whole idea. So like she sets up right from the start this uh, visionary metaphor. So the idea of light and seeing the way and, and, and stuff like that. But she also wants you to think about attention, all right? Think about it. The closer you focus on something, the easier it is to see what it actually is or to see through it. Think about when someone's like feeding you bullshit and talking rubbish to you. Now, if you're not paying attention closely, if you're just letting the words wash over you, you're gonna miss that maybe they're trying to lie to you or maybe they're trying to scam you or maybe trying to cheat you out of something. But if you're, sh if you're sharp, if you're switched on, if you're not looking at TikTok, if you're not scrolling through your Facebook feed, you'll notice, hey, something's going on here. You shine a light on that. So this whole idea of shining a light is about giving focus and attention 
so you know the right way. You know the right way when you're looking backwards at history and also when you're looking forwards and in the present day. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift. See how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the direction of the wind. And I love this. Can you notice that there's a rhyme here, but it's not an end-stopped rhyme, okay? If this was more a more traditional poem, if uh, the poet wasn't playing with the form of the poem so, so, so lovingly, I think she's really doing a good job of playing around with the poem here. If she was just like Blake, for example, she'd put the rhyme at the end. So instead of easily, we'd have the word drift and it would rhyme all neatly with shift. But there's this idea of actual shifting. The rhyming, the first rhyming word, is in the middle of the, uh, that line. Feel the drift, but the, the line goes on. See how easily they fall away on a sigh. A shift. Right, so there's this idea, you can actually see the shift. So the fact that the first rhyme comes in the middle of the meter and then the next one comes at the end, really, really once again focuses you and draws your attention to this idea of shifting. What's shifting? It's transformation, it's change. So look, we've got all this imagery, all these like, all these words associated with light and seeing the way and guidance, but it's all about changing as well. Altering, all right? We give, we give attention to things so we can alter. So we're giving attention to this like holy book which contains, you know, words of wisdom, but also contains our identity. And so we change, all right? And we turn transparent with attention and then shift. Anyway, <clears throat> if buildings were paper, I might feel their drift See how easily they fall away on a sigh. So what she's saying is, paper is very fragile. You throw it away, rip it up, shred it. I mean, paper's not gonna last forever. You have all these histories and names printed and they detail like thousands of years of history, but the paper itself is very delicate, which is an idea that she wants to reinforce because at the end, she's going to make you draw a connection with skin, make you think about skin and how delicate that is, therefore how delicate human life is. So if paper is a metaphor for human life, what she's really saying is life is precious. So she's saying, hey, we see these great big buildings, these impressive buildings, but if it was paper, we'd see how, how precious they are, how precious human life is, because buildings are made by humans, okay? But we sometimes forget that buildings won't be here forever. Buildings will crumble and fall, and if you look at Ozymandias, there was this great king who's like, created this sculpture so everyone could worship him, you know? But haha, <laughs> joke's on him, it's probably thousands of years in the future, and the sculpture has crumbled, and he's buried under sand, and nobody remembers him, okay? Nobody even barely remembers um, the statue. The fact is, when we're reading Ozymandias, we're just reading a recollection that was told to the poet. The poet himself didn't even see the statue. He met a traveler from this antique land. Friend of a friend of a friend. It's like, we don't remember the king. He's, he's long gone. And the thing is, if, we, if, if buildings were made of paper, we'd realize this. Okay, so there's this progression. Buildings, paper, more fragile, human life. It's all connected, okay? So we get these great big structures, often because we want to overcome nature, we want to be more powerful, but we're precious, all right? Life is short, life is delicate, and um, we're running out of time, and, it's, and it, it could end any time, okay? And there's this whole idea as well, she draws attention to the idea of wind. So what she's saying is, the power of humanity is less than the power of nature. Now we can argue that humans are a part of nature, which I, I would say is true, obviously, but there's this whole idea that we're not invincible. And in the grand scheme of things, we are just a bit of paper blowing in the wind. When you put it in contrast, our human life, the little things that we do to remind us that we're human, put it against nature, we see how delicate we are. All right, maps two. I love this because it's just two words and she really wants us to focus on this image. Why does she want us to focus? Because there's a pause, there's a caesura, there's a full stop there. She really, she doesn't want us to go on, she wants us to really consider the idea of maps. Okay, so this, you know, the holy book can be a map, it's spiritual guidance, but she's talking about actual maps. And to be honest, when was the last time you actually looked at a paper map? I mean, this is what my map looks like, okay? So, but I remember actually when I was doing like the Duke of Edinburgh Award, um, we got a paper map and we tried to follow it. And if you've ever tried to follow a paper map when you're in the real world, 
My goodness, I mean firstly the wind is blowing it all over the place, it's very fragile, it's hard to follow, and we got lost as hell. So what's she saying about maps? She's saying, maps, the sun shines through their borderlines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds. So she's pointing out how fragile maps are, and I think when she says the sun shines through their borderlines, once again, she's not just talking literally. Okay, when you read the Bible or the Quran, yeah, the paper's very thin, so you can see through it. That's the literal interpretation. But the word and the wisdom it contains, you see through it because you see with greater clarity. Now, what she's saying about maps is, yeah, a map you can probably see through, it's probably quite thin and it's delicate, but it shines through borderlines. The sun shines through borderlines. Sun, the sun is greater than this man-made object, this map. It's arbitrary. What humans decide, this is our territory, this is your territory, my country, my country, your country. Borders? Borders were not here before humans. Not really, not in the way that we put it up and we mark it down on a map. And we kid ourselves into thinking that it's always going to be this way. This is England, this is Wales, this is Scotland, here's the line, here's the line for this. But really, these things will change, and they've been shifting throughout history all the time. So something greater, the sun, which is a symbol of power, the power of nature, is also a symbol of God or spiritual guidance or something greater than humans, shows how insignificant these borders are. Is she, is the poet, making a comment, a political comment? Who knows? She, she might just be saying, hey, there is something greater there's something greater than borders. There's something greater than political division. There's something more natural, okay? You can see through it. If you focus your attention, you can see through silly things like political division and borders. And then she says, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds. So this is quite strong. This is a very strong way to end the stanza because it's quite bloated, right? You've got these very strong nouns plus a comma separating them. So rivers make roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, just boom, image, image, image. So image followed by a pause, image followed by a pause. And this might signify that these are like immovable objects. If you think about it, well, we think, you know, a mountain fold, that's quite immovable, isn't it? The, the lines that rivers make. But what she's saying is no, the sun shines through. A greater understanding of the world and yourself and life and the nature of humanity and the universe, blah, blah, blah. A greater understanding will make you realize that these things, you can see through them. And the thing is, rivers do change. The course of rivers do change. Mountain folds do change. Roads do change. All this stuff changes. So it's only on paper, like the paper we're reading, that it looks like an immovable object. But really, these things, are just as delicate as the thing in the next stanza. What does she go on to say? She's basically comparing roads and, and, and the markings on a page that, that mark boundaries and borders. She's comparing them to fine slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card. And these things, she's saying, they might fly our lives like paper kites. Might fly our lives like paper kites. What's she saying? Imagine a kite. I mean, when was the last time you, you uh, flew a kite? I mean, it's been ages for me. But imagine this, this a receipt as a kite. But she's basically saying that these things, these markings on a paper, these like things that show what we bought, you know, material items, these writings and maps and boundaries, all this stuff like materialism, it controls us. So our life is up there. And this is flying, I like this is our life, ooh, floating in the wind. I also think the poet is making a comment and saying that these things like receipts, she's talking about, you know, you can see these slips from grocery shops, they record how much was spent, you know, and did you buy it on credit card? She's also saying this says more about our day-to-day -day life, really. This is, a, this is a story that is almost the same as you write in your history at the back of the Quran, and you've got these maps that show where your people came from and where they settled. But you, the individual, you've got your daily life. And you know, what did you buy today? That's the story of your day. You went to the shop and you bought this, you got a receipt. That's the story. That's what, that's your identity today. That's something that you're doing. Let's keep going. An architect could use all this, place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, 
and never wish to build again with brick or block, but let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths. We build these great structures, these big buildings, but the reason we do is because of pride, okay? She even, she even uses the word pride through the shapes that pride can make. Um, and if you remember Ozymandias, that's, that's about the ugliness of pride and also the futility of pride because you might be proud now and proud of what you look like, proud of this structure that you made, but it won't last forever. So what she's really saying is an architect can build all this stuff, but if he, he or she thinks a bit more clearly, thinks about nature, thinks about how fragile life is, they might put the energy into raising a family, raise a structure never meant to last, a structure of living tissue. So really, we are all architects of our own lives. We are builders and creators of our own lives. You are the creator, I am the creator. Yeah, we can build these great buildings, but really, isn't it all about recording your history and like knowing where you came from and going forward? So one day you'll write in your family history on the back of the Quran, but then the next you are passing on your genes. Maybe you're raising a family and stuff like that. Living tissue, all right? It's as fragile, but as precious. And perhaps it is a pride that is worth indulging. Think about Trump Tower. That's all about Trump's pride. You know, got his name on it and stuff. But really, isn't, isn't it better to be proud of family and what you can pass down and stuff like that? She might be saying this, she might not. This is just me wondering out loud. But anyway, an architect place layer over layer. Again, over, over. Script over numbers, over line. This repetition, layering on top, on the top, on the top. And so basically it's this idea of complexity. You can build all these complex structures, but when you know the true nature of things, you know the, true, you know the fact that these things won't last forever and that there's more important things in life, an architect might think, I don't want to build with brick or block, but let the daylight break. Now think of those words, brick, block, break. The poet uses enjambement between stanzas. In all the other ones, she has end stop. Like, look at the first one. Paper thinned by age or touching. Pause. Who was born to whom? Second stanza. Pause. Transparent with attention. Pause. In the direction of the wind. Pause. Rail tracks, mountain folds. Pause. Might fly our lives like paper kites. Pause. And then, and never wish to build again with brick or block. Enjambement. Enjambement. She goes straight through one stanza to another. No pausing. And this symbolizes, represents, signifies transformation. Okay, this is the whole transformation that happens as you're reading, as we're reading the poem, we're transforming. We're seeing the light. The more we focus our attention, the more we see. So if we focus and go, hey, there's a, there's a change happening here. Well, the change is happening to us. And you'll see by the end of the poem, the change is we're going from paper to skin. We're going from seeing, you know, things that are markers of humanity, but ultimately insignificant, like buildings. And we're gonna build something more worthwhile. We're gonna put investment in ourselves, in us as humans. There's a change happening. Build again with brick or block, but let the daylight break. Buh, 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 kuh, kuh, kuh. Buh, buh, buh is a plosive sound, plosive alliteration. Kuh, kuh, kuh is a cacophony. And these are very strong, especially because they're monosyllabic, one syllable, simple words. Brick, block, break. It's like she is trying to actually break, but using words. She's trying to use words to create a transformation. And sometimes you have to break things in order to transform. Sometimes you have to shine a light thing on things in order to see the true nature of them. Let daylight, back to daylight, this whole idea of vision and paying attention and, sit and guidance and, and maybe even religion. Let daylight break through capitals and monoliths. So, okay, let daylight break through capitals and monoliths. So capitals as in capital cities and monoliths like big buildings, big structures. But there's a double meaning here. Okay, capitals can also mean like capital letters, I think anyway. So there's this whole idea of not only do you want light to shine through these buildings and you realize that these buildings won't last forever, but when you're reading the words, you wanna, let, you wanna go through the paper, you wanna shine a light through as well because the paper won't last. The ink that made the capital letter, you know, think of a capital letter, it's really big, it's a big structure. Um, it, it signifies that something important's coming, the whole rest of the sentence, it's the first letter. Shine through that, because that's not gonna last either. Paper, and that written on paper, just like the buildings, won't last forever. 
Get in there, we're getting to the end, don't worry. We're almost there, I know this took a while. So it talks about the, the architect wants to find a way to trace a grand design. And again, enjambement. This whole idea that in the other stanzas, the ones leading up, it's almost like it is more of a rigid, strong form, the poetic form, which might mirror the strong form of a building. But with more on Jean Munt, you know there's a transformation coming, something that's more long lasting. So how do we trace this grand design? Well, it's not with buildings. Now the form of the poet, poem itself is changing. A grand design with living tissue, okay? Living tissue, so anyone who's done biology, you know that we're made up of tissue, um, and that tissue is not like, you know, the tissue we blow our nose with, but it's equally as delicate, okay? And tissue is a metaphor for life. Raise a structure never meant to last. That's the thing, when you raise a structure, made out of human tissue. So when you raise a child, okay, it is almost like a structure and you're becoming a human and you're developing into this, this great being. But we weren't supposed to live forever. We're not meant to last. And I think people forget when they build these buildings, just like the king in Ozymandias, people forget that this won't last forever and that a building's not meant to last. Human life's not meant to last. So if we can put our pride away for a second and realize that there's something more important, and it's more important than borders and boundaries like you see on a map. There's more, something more important than like spending and money and having money control our lives, like with the, um, the paper that flies our lives like paper kites. Um, it's, there's something more important than that. And it's about being here and now and paying attention. So raise a structure. So the architect goes from being a builder to someone we think is gonna be a writer. So gonna do a, make a structure of paper, smooth and stroked. Once again, it's like really delicate, okay? And thinned to be transparent, turned into your skin. Now look at that. Each stanza has four lines, makes it a quatrain. But there's an extra line, one that's like, shows not only the significance of what the poet's saying, but also the imperfection. Okay, so this isn't a perfect structure, and this is something that stands apart. The fact that there's an extra line, and it's all about something that has transformed, so we've got this idea of turned, a transformation has happened, turned into skin. We've gone through this, we've read the whole poem and we've realized that paper's not very important. Paper's important for what it can tell us about us, but paper's important in that how it connects to us as a human being and it connects through skin. And skin, like when you touch skin, when you look at someone's skin, you know, when you shake someone's hand, you, there's a, that's a living thing, it's living tissue, and it's very, very delicate. And that's more important than these buildings and maps and boundaries and, you know, and, and we know that we're precious because the poet begins, again, with, she uses the same language, smoothed and stroked. Like in the beginning, when she's touching the Quran and the pages, well now, once again, smoothed and stroked is all about touching skin very very delicately but here's the kicker all right so you might think that you know oh skin like skin color it'll tell you something about the history and that's really important no she's saying delicately with understanding and care and attention smooth stroke the skin and it's thinned to transparency so it's like you don't even see skin you see what's beneath the skin skin's not important skin again it's just like boundaries on a map you know it's that's not the important thing the important thing is what you can see within so this is all about looking deep at this human, appreciating a human for what they are on a human level. Now they might not last forever, but right now we can appreciate the human in front of us. Okay, so let's recap and also expand a little bit on this, all right? So some key ideas to keep in mind when you're going over tissue. There's a paradox throughout the whole poem, and the paradox is this. Paper is fragile, but controls our lives. Paper controls our lives in regards to where we see boundaries with other countries, maps, territory, homes. It controls our lives where, how we can get spiritual wisdom, like through the Quran, you know, the paper and the light shining through. It controls our lives in what we spend, that's our day-to-day -day life. And we can see this idea of paper controlling our lives with this image of it flying our lives like kites, okay? And, but there's this idea that we are very, very fragile, like paper. We are made up of living tissue. We are fragile. Our lives are fragile. And we are more fragile than nature. This idea that humans, synonymous with paper, drifting in the wind. So think about what it means to drift. It means you don't really have any control. Like a bigger force is putting control on you. It's almost like you don't have so much free will yourself. Like so much 
of how you live your day-to-day -day life is also connected with your history and your background and that's how that's your identity really isn't it and then there's also this idea that life is more complex and fragile than what we create again we've seen this as Ozymandias the great king who tried to create a structure and it got buried and crumpled through age and buried under the sand and you can see in that poem how Shelley talks about the crumpled statue uh, or this king's works but then contrast that with the boundless desert this idea that this is just a you know a fallen statue of someone who doesn't even live anymore but nature is so much more powerful and boundless boundless limitless so we're, we're fragile like that king and like the structures we create that's why in this poem the poet ponders she says well an architect might think nah sod that i'm not going to build a building they're going to realize they've they've changed their mindsets turned because they've focused their attention they've shined the light so to speak on this whole idea and then they realize, oh, we're gonna, not gonna build these structures anymore. Or maybe they will, but maybe they'll realize that there's something more important, the complexity of life, living tissue. And there's, yeah, this whole idea of control and freedom, like how much freedom do we really have? Well, obviously we've just talked about how paper controls our lives, but there's this idea that we're yearning for freedom. And you can see that with how the poet uses en Jean Munt in the, in the poem, this whole idea of you know, not being bound by structure because structures crumble and fall, just like the statue. So this idea that maybe we want to be more one with nature. That's what enjambment might symbolize, more flowing, more free. Um, so this idea that we want freedom. Buildings are restrictive. We want to be more natural, okay? Because we're, we're fragile anyway, but we've got to embrace something, something that's greater than words on a page, something that's greater than buildings. And so here's a question for you. I mean, you don't need to know this for GCSE, but think about what if we could see through borders, like country borders and boundaries? What if we could see through money? What if we could see through this idea of family? I'm British, or I'm Japanese, or I'm American, or I'm Canadian, or, you know, or I'm Chinese. Hey everybody, I'm Chinese! Or something like this. Stuff that defines us, but it's like, what if we could see through that? What if there was something beneath it? And like, money controls our day-to-day -day lives, what we buy and stuff like, but what if we saw through if we realized how fragile this paper is and then start thinking about how fragile our life is, what does it all really mean? You know what I mean? And the great thing about the ending to this poem, the fact that the line stands apart, not only symbolizes transformation, not only symbolizes that we have changed from thinking that buildings and structures are more important than life itself, it signifies the importance of you here today and your identity and what you really mean and who you really are. The poet has talked about heritage, talked about you know spirituality, talked about the preciousness of life. And at the end, she uses the direct address, doesn't she? She says, your skin, turned into your skin. Now she's saying, think about what all this means for you. That's what the important thing is. Like This is no longer words on a page. If she didn't have that, and it was just somebody else's life or somebody else talking, maybe you think, oh, okay, that's a pretty poem, or well, maybe you think that poem sucks, I hope it doesn't come up in GCSE, but whatever. But what she's saying is, your skin, all right? Stop looking at the paper, look at your skin and try and look beneath it, transparent. I think what she's saying is she's talking about the soul, something that you can't quite put into words, something that you can't quite see. Right, I'm gonna stop the video here because it's already long enough. Um, we could talk about this all day. That was just a little analysis of the poem. Now, if you want me to actually show you like a line by line analysis, like maybe we'll write it together, we'll go through the poem and I'll underline things. Maybe you want to go through some practice questions. Like I have a whole bunch we can talk about that talks about tissue, how it compares to other poems. Or maybe you want a video on another poem that you're struggling with or another text. Maybe you want something completely different. Maybe you want something like a video about, you know, different poetic techniques, whatever. What I want to ask you now, tell me what you want to see. All right. So I'm making this video because I really want to help you get the best mark possible in GCSE English. I want you to do really well. And not only that, I don't just want you to do well. I want you to actually come away thinking a little bit. I want you to think, Hey, that, that actually meant something that poem. It wasn't just, you know, some piece of annoying rubbish that I got to tick off a box so that I can get a mark and all that. I want you to actually kind of enjoy it. Now, obviously you're not going to probably enjoy yourself in the exam hall too much, but let's not make this painful. Let's actually have some fun with it and let's think about what these poems really mean. 
um, in the context of your life and all that sort of thing because we can learn so much from this stuff. So what I need you to do is to hit the like button because that will tell me that you liked this video and that you want more. Hit subscribe because again that will tell me that people actually want to see more of this sort of thing and they found it useful. And not only that, if this would be a huge help to you and also me. Put a comment and leave down below. Tell me, firstly, tell me what you think of tissue now, now that we've gone through it. Do you still hate it? Or do you understand it a bit more? Or did you actually once like it, but now you hate it? Whatever, let me know your thoughts on that. And let me know what you want to see next. Thanks for reading along with Tissue. And hopefully, see you again soon.